Today's episode is sponsored by Future State Media, experts in off Amazon traffic for Amazon sellers. Future State Media will build you a custom made website to deliver sales for you on Amazon. Built to grab traffic from search engines and social media, your site can be used as a secret weapon for launching products on Amazon or just to stabilize your Amazon sales. It means you can also build an email list on autopilot. Go to futurestatemedia.com for your free guide to Google SEO for Amazon sellers today. One of the things I think is remarkably rare in online based businesses, perhaps understandably, is that people don't go and talk to normal people offline. And I think with the private label business, which as you said, we'll talk about in the next show, but it's a much more complicated business model in many ways. It's even more insane that people don't go and talk to end consumers. And I spend my life just begging any clients that I'm working on creating private or, or custom pro um, products. I would just beg them to go and talk to end users. It's even better if you're an end user yourself, but so uh, basic and yet people just don't tend to do it. So absolutely hats off for that. And fascinating that, that things came out so clearly to basically one point and that's often the result isn't it that you go and talk to you know 30 people whatever it is and you'll end up with one single sentence out of it that is the critical one but knowing that is I guess the prize right that's that's what you got out of it I mean what else would you say you got out of your your conversations with your 30 or well that's the thing that's the thing about as you're talking about private label um, I'm thinking of the Canton Fair which and, and I should back up I actually went to China back in 2004 one of the wow. things I skipped in my bio, I actually, my very first online business, I used to sell jewelry on eBay <laughs> as a part-time gig while I was running my, my technology services company because I just stumbled into that. But I think something that, that new entrepreneurs fail to grasp the importance of is what happens at trade shows that you can't predict or plan for. So in the case of say private label, the common methodology is you sit down and you do product research and you use jungle scout and you use these tools and you're using the same tools that everybody else is using. You're applying the same filters that everybody else is applying and you're looking at the same results that everybody else is looking at. When you go to a trade show, maybe you're randomly wandering the aisle and you come across this product and it's like, you think it's just like the coolest thing ever for whatever reason it resonates with you, but it didn't show up on jungle scout. It didn't show up on viral launch or anything. And then you talk to the people that make it and you figure it out and you learn some stuff and maybe that's not the product, but maybe that gives you an idea for a product. And then you go somewhere else in the trade show and you find somebody else that makes a thing that looks, looks more like the thing. And none of that happens if you don't go to the trade show because you need conversations with people to help you to get ideas in your head, which you can then iterate on. But if you didn't have the conversation, the seed idea never got in your skull. There's an expression. I have a video on YouTube that ranked number one for years for how to start a business. It has millions of views. And it's all about this thing. I explain this green dot theory, which I'll take like 60 seconds and explain what it is. So you don't have to watch a 10 minute video. But basically when you're starting off in business, you decide I'm going to sell green dots. Obviously green dots is a metaphor for whatever your product is. So you go out there and you're trying to sell green dots, but you're not selling very many of them. And as you're trying to get better and better at selling green dots, you actually discover that there's blue dots and blue dots are a little easier to sell. They sell a little better. So you start selling blue dots now. Now green dots, thing of the past, not doing that anymore. Now I'm focused on blue dots and I'm actually doing okay. I'm kind of like breaking even getting by, but I'm always trying to get better at selling my blue dots. And eventually I figure out that there's these things called black triangles and everybody wants to buy black triangles. So I pivot my business again. I'm now selling black triangles. I got an Inc. 5,000 award. I'm crushing it. What's the moral of the story? If you never decided to try and sell green dots, you would have never, ever, ever, ever discovered that there was a market for black triangles. And this is the thing that new entrepreneurs don't understand. They sit back and they're like, I am not going to start until I discover black triangles. Guess what? You will never be successful and you will never start. Trade shows help you to discover green dots and maybe some blue dots, maybe even a black triangle. But if you don't go to a trade show, none of that happens. Amazing. It sounds like you're the uh, poster boy really for the, the iteration principle, which is like get started 
and then you'll find stuff on the way and i guess the other thing you're saying is trade shows are amazing unfortunately at a time of recording in late may 2020 that they're all cancelled but uh, you okay. know you can do the same online to a certain degree but i would also say any form of conversation just to broaden your points any form yes. of conversation with relevant players which is to say either a supplier or god forbid a an end consumer is going to help you think things through i remember forcing some guy once in a, a group that i no longer run because it's for startups that, that hadn't started as it were pre-revenue startups which, which as you say most people never get to the point of revenue and i remember this guy said i want to sell baby stuff uh, you know it's a baby saying, changing mat that, that folded into a backpack or whatever i said great there is a mother opposite you here go and talk to her so we all sat there and he just uh, talked to her about baby stuff and it was very interesting he didn't have kids she did he had a two and a half year old so it was instantly a few very important things in Emerged about what the product needed to do, which would yeah, probably never have occurred to him by just reading Amazon reviews. So, good old conversation. Um, so <laughs> I, I do have a hack. I do have a hack for you that people can use in the absence Please. of trade shows. Yes, you can contact brands and say, "I am an analyst. I'm working on a research report that I plan to publish in the next couple of months." Uh, that's going to cover blah 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 blah. I would love to talk to you to get your insights to weave it into my research. People will take your call. They'll give you the time. Whether you produce the report or not at the end is irrelevant because by then they'll have forgotten. They'll have forgotten who you are. It doesn't really matter. Is it a little bit gray area deceptive? Yeah, you're stealing an hour of their time that you, if you don't produce the report, they're never going to get a return on. But there are worse offenses in the world than stealing an hour of somebody's time. Yeah, this is true. But also, I think, why not produce the report? I, I think that's a great reason to go back to somebody with an email, a legitimate reason to go back to somebody with stuff that they've been involved Absolutely. in. Absolutely. I think that's just great. I, I think it's super smart marketing. I, I would definitely see it as a criminal offense, not wasting the eyes of their time so much, but as a marketing sin to have a, a person who's been willing to talk to you for an hour and then not to follow up. That would be insane. So, yeah, brilliant. That's a great, great hack. I'm going to take that one. <laughs> My VAs are going to be busy. All right, so let, let's come to the, your, the tools you use because i know we want to talk about um, private label versus uh, wholesale but i'm going to hold that discussion off for a whole different topic because i think it is a a big thing so tools tell me about this obviously we we've talked about you know lots of smart things you did but one of the things you did was to set up uh, flows that got you a ton more prospective clients than most people do which is why you succeeded because you got to practice more than everyone else which means you get better at the calls and everything else flows well so tell me about the tools that the process set up side and the, the big picture of that well when we initially started um i just wrote instructions in google docs and i very quickly came to realize that that wasn't necessarily the best approach and i know a lot of folks they like to create so, so the tools, and by tools, Michael, I'm assuming that you mean you want me to talk about the processes that I created as opposed to third-party pieces of software that I've used. Yes, exactly. Yes, I, I, it wasn't a good question, but you're, you're exactly right. You've improved the question. <laughs> Tell me about the processes, not the tools. So the processes, for every task that you want, uh, that you're going to need somebody to do over and over and over and over and over, Ideally, you have a, a process or a recipe or a description, we call it a, a standard operating procedures, the term we use, or SOP. And all that is, is essentially a fancy checklist. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And in those checklists, we have a very high level of detail that describes specifically how to do this and how to do this in step three and step four and step five. So I created those docs and uh, and initially, they just lived in a, a software application. Well, initially, they lived in Google Docs, but I came to realize that wasn't very effective for a variety of reasons. The most important ones were that it didn't give me a way to easily assign a task to a specific individual on my team with a deadline. I had to incorporate another app if I was going to put my processes in just a Google Doc because Google is not a task management tool at all. So then we used another piece of software um, for the first, oh, I don't know, maybe a year or so. And so this software allowed us to create processes and allowed us to assign it to an individual and then give each assignment a due date so that if a due date was missed, we were alerted to that fact. So I, every process, right from, so initially, obviously we're very focused on sourcing product. So in the wholesale wor world, that starts with um, some aspect of product research. 
Um, then once you've got your short list of leads, as it were, then you've got to get the contact information for the companies and then you actually have to contact the companies. So there's a bunch of processes for that product extractions, competitor analysis, uh, finding the contact information, going on LinkedIn, et cetera, so that you could send an email at the door. So we had processes for all of that. Then of course, once you start landing accounts, now you have new processes that you need. How do I issue a purchase order? How do I onboard a new supplier? Uh, we were doing our own prep initially. So how do we receive goods and how do we reconcile and how do we prep and then how do we create an inbound shipping order to Amazon? And then if we were doing listing optimizations, we needed to process for that. If we needed to do ad campaigns, we needed to process for that. Amazon account health, we needed to process for that. Dealing with returns, we needed to process for that. Like, Amazon is, is, I mean, selling on Amazon is really just the same stuff over and over and over and over again. So we ended up creating processes for absolutely everything. Um, and we're now at the point in the story where, uh, Mike, if you want me to, I can talk about, you know, how I, I got invited by Dan to speak at one of his events and how Webs was created, or I, I don't know what road you'd want to go down now. Well, um, I think let's talk about your, um, your processes. I mean, the first thing to reflect is what you just said. I think a really important point to say is that selling on Amazon is the same thing and again and again and again, which is really important insight because I believe that it's an either an opportunity or a nightmare. I think it's an opportunity if you do what you've done and create processes and outsource it. And I think it's a nightmare if you just do it the same yourself because it just feels like Groundhog Day and no wonder everybody gives up, right? So I think that's an important point. And um, it's great that you got invited to, to speak at the, the wholesale conference. I'm not, I'd love to just dig into the tool that I know you've created about this because you've implied already the tools you had were not really quite fit for purpose. Um, so, the main thing being that you need to create a standardized task, but then be able to assign it to people for with due dates and and um, yeah. have an alert if that didn't happen. So tell me about the creation of uh, your own software for that. Yeah, so it, it it's a black triangle. It kind of happened by accident. So I spoke at this conference and I got on stage and I said, hey, I'm here to tell you all how I grew my company so quickly. I don't have anything for sale. Uh, so take good notes. Off you go. Ready? Here we go. And so I gave an hour long, highly detailed talk about my product sourcing strategy. And obviously I talked about SOPs a lot because they were critical to my success. And much to my surprise, a bunch of people came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I love that idea of having SOPs. I don't know how to create them. I don't want to create them. Can I just buy a copy of yours? And after enough people asked me, it occurred to me, Black Triangle, that there might be a really big demand for pre-made SOPs for Amazon sellers, especially from a guy selling sold by a guy who's had a lot of success on Amazon. So we decided to make them available. Um, the first release of the product we were, we sold way more than we expected. And that's when the light bulb went on. Oh, I need a software application because our content was still living in this other company's software and now that my SOPs weren't just a thing that I used internally, they were actually a product that other people were going to use. I ran into all sorts of limitations of not owning and controlling the software layer. So I went to a very good friend of mine who had already built and sold a software company. And I said, look, this is what happened. This is what we need to do. Do you want to be my partner? He said, yes, he did. So we spent a year writing code and during that year, I was the product creator. I was the beta user, the alpha user, the guinea pig. I mean, my, my company and my team was the only customer that Flowster had for the first year as we were writing code. And there was a lot of bugs in the beginning. And of course, you know, we find them every day and we get rid of them. And that's really how the software company started. And now, you know, fast forward another year and a half-ish, we have thousands upon thousands of people who are reliant on Flowster every single day to manage all their highly repeatable processes. And regardless of what business you're in, if you've been a C, whether it's Amazon or whatever, if you've been a CEO or a company founder for more than like a lunch break, you're going to figure out there are a couple of really important things you need to do to grow. And one of them is stop doing everything yourself because then you're just the bottleneck of your own business. 
And number two is, well, then you need to, if you're not going to do everything yourself, you need to be able to delegate it to somebody else. And the biggest mistake that I see new and that I made initially is, is you're like, oh, I'm just going to go hire somebody who has experience in doing this thing and it'll all turn out beautifully. Well, in, in, unless you're super well-funded and can afford the top-notch salaries, which I could never do in the beginning, you're only going to get a B or a C player, which means they're not very good at doing their job. That's why they're not commanding the top salary. That's why they don't have the gold-plated resume. So you're going to end up hiring C players and hoping to create an A-level company. Well, that doesn't happen. So what I found was um, the, the thing that, that CEOs sh should be caring about is, yeah, I got to hire people, but I got to make sure I have a process in place first for them to follow. Now, they might improve it down the road, but you need to have that process in place for them to be able to work from so that you know, because you're the one that created the process, you know that things are getting done to your standard at a minimum. If they can iterate and improve, good, great for you, all the more benefit. And that does happen. I think you just made an extremely important point, which funnily enough um, echoes a point that I was discussing with my co-host in uh, the e-commerce leader with, with um, my co-host Jason Miles, who does not sell on Amazon at all, but works with a lot of um, e-commerce business leaders. And that's the simple thing that you can't hire in to solve your problem because you can't afford the level of people that would create the, the right level of business. So the solution is having a process, which means that you can get a, an A-grade outcome from C-grade people, if you like. And that sounds, I guess, a bit judgmental, but an excellent outcome from average people because of an excellent process. So I, I really think that um, you all missed a process for me in, in this way. And uh, the Flowster app that you've created, I've, as I said, I came across you as a potential podcast guest having um, actually started off as a Flowster user. So I find it really, really helpful. Um, I think it's something everyone should check out because if nothing else, it will force you to think about the processes. Um, so if you go to amazingfba.com forward slash Flowster, that's going to redirect to a few different offers. Can you just uh, let us know what uh, what things you can offer people at Flowster, first of all? Sure. So, and, and I'm assuming you will just put links to all this stuff on your landing yes. page. I'll go through, I'll go through what I have available and then you can um, put on there whatever you would like. So Flowster itself is at this point in time, we have what we call the freemium model. You can come and use the software for free and you can create up to five SOP templates in your account. So at a minimum, somebody could come sign up for Flowster and create their own SOPs. What I have found is that most people don't want to create their own SOPs. They would prefer to have one pre-made and maybe they want to edit it a little bit. Maybe they want to use it as it is, um, but it's a lot easier than starting from scratch. So in our SOP marketplace, uh, it's kind of like Amazon. There's like a search box and a drop down list and you'll find that there is a page of Amazon specific um, SOPs and you could link directly to that page, Mike, if you'd like. Some of them are free. Some of them have a, have a cost. I think you and I talked beforehand that the, we're going to give uh, a promo code for the brand pre-call research SOP. Um, and that SOP is the process that I use when a brand replies to one of my emails and says, yes, yes, we will have a conversation with you. That is the process, this brand pre-call research is the process that I use to make sure that when I, or now can explain, please show up to that call super prepared because you only get one chance to make a first impression. You better know what the hell you're talking about. You better have got it all figured out. So that normally sells its price right now for 109 bucks and we'll give that to your audience for free. And then um, I mentioned to you this finding competitors on Amazon, which absolutely should be delegated to a virtual assistant. Um, we'll give that one for free as well. And then um, I also have, Mike, if you, I have a, uh, an, uh, an on-demand webinar. If people want to learn more specifically about, you know, how to source products on Amazon, I have a webinar that they can go into. There will be an offer at the end of that webinar for, I think it's our webs product, which is my flagship product. It's either that or a subsidiary product. Or, uh, I can't remember which one we have two of them that are. So webs is the collection of the 75 or 80. I don't even know how many there are now standard operating procedures that my team relies on to run 
our Amazon business. So we, we've sold millions of dollars worth of those to other Amazon sellers in the last two years. And then I have a scaled down for, and that sells for like 2,500 bucks. We have a scaled down version of that called product sourcing for professionals, which is like what I consider to be the bare, bare, bare minimum stuff that you need. And the webinar special on that, I think is like $379. Um, so you can put links to whatever you would like to those things to the, to the web. Anyway, if they go watch the webinar on demand, I can't remember. It's one of those two offers that's at the end. Um, and you could also just link to the web's sales page if you, if you want to do so. Absolutely. Well, look, just to simplify for listeners, just go to amazingfba.com forward slash flowster. That's F L O W S for sugar, T E R, flowster. And we'll put all those links in there. Then you don't have to worry about trying to remember yes. them because <laughs> it'll be 10 different coupon codes, what have you. So, yeah, brilliant. Well, listen, Trent, very, very interesting stuff. I really like the um the business-like and, and intelligent process thinking that you've applied and i think there are lessons there for anyone who's you know if anyone's listening and going they turned off a while ago mentally because you're doing wholesale business model and they're running a private level business and a heck of a lot of that stuff applies to any businesses and absolutely applies to an amazon private label business so i think most of the the lessons um still retain and also, the Flowster app, I think it's going to be just as useful, mm-hmm. right? So it's got a lot of SOPs. I've, I've delved into using several of them for private label businesses already. So um, we're going to have a quick chat about the private label versus wholesale thing, because that's that's a mission I'm on to try and educate private label obsessives with the wholesale model. But for the moment, I'm just going to say many, many thanks for sharing your thoughts about process. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. 